Ye is in the building. <laughs> Throw your motherfucking hands in the air right now. Put your hands in the air right now. Yeah. Put your hands in the air right now. The air right now. All right. Right. It's time for a new Deep Discog Dive, which means it's time to check the results of the first ever Deep Discog Dive decision. Someone else came up with that name. Turns out I could keep the alliteration after all. The poll by all accounts went well, and I'll be running another one for next month's dive, which you can find in the description down below. One slight change, though, is that the poll is gonna end on the first of the month from here on out. So in this case, May 1st. And as always, you are more than welcome to leave comments suggesting artists. Looking at the results, most of this makes sense to me. I was expecting most of this. Uh, though I wonder how many votes the best band of all time, Spoon, got. Oh. Uh, well, what about one of my other favorite bands, Wolfpack? Wait, how are they below Limp Biscuit? But enough dashing of my hopes and dreams. Today, we're, we're talking about Kanye. Picasso is dead. Steve Jobs is dead. Walt Disney is dead. I'm dead. Do I need to tell you who Kanye West is? Born in Atlanta, raised in Chicago, he got his start in the late 90s as a hip hop producer. His big break came from his major role on Jay-Z's The Blueprint in 2001, and he has since become a hip hop wonderkind, achieving a status that very few musicians or even people hold today. And that status is primarily because of his nine main studio albums, plus a few that we'll bring up briefly. It's also primarily because of that discography that he has amassed a fan base that is very passionate. So to be as clear as I can be, everything I say about Kanye and his albums is my opinion. I am not some grand authority on music. I am not forcing you to agree with me. You are welcome to disagree as long as you're respectful. And what I say about him and his albums should not detract from your own experiences. Okay? Right. So, I don't care much for the college dropout. That doesn't mean I think it's bad. I don't, I don't think it's bad. I came into Kanye's work years after this one came out and that in the moment rush that so many experience with this one, I, I, just, I just don't have it. But I do still think that Kanye's debut album is solid, mainly because Kanye's production on this thing has aged so gracefully. The soulful sound of this record is timeless. From We Don't Care to All Falls Down to Spaceship, Family Business, the piano on that gives me chills every time I hear it. It is so emotive in its simplicity. Is it perfect? No, the skits haven't really aged that well, and the last track, Last Call, just kind of goes on and on for too long, in my opinion. But I can at least understand why it does, though. It, it's Kanye's victory lap, in a sense. He's thankful for so many people who have given him a chance. You can't fault Kanye for his moxie and determination. Well, actually, no, you, you can, but uh, not, not on this record. We've got, we've got more records to get through. Now this is my jam. After the success of Dropout, Kanye teamed up with producer John Bryan for his second album. John Bryan, of course, supplements Kanye's sole influence with an orchestral slant, and good God, do these two work together so well. This album is gorgeous. The piano on Heard Him Say, the Shirley Bassey sample on Diamonds from Sierra Leone, the piano and strings leading into the outro on Gone. And throughout it all, Kanye struggles with his newfound fame, the injustices surrounding him, and how to balance it all with his commitment to family and where he came from. Great album. Fun fact, Heard Him Say features Adam Levine from Maroon 5, which on its own is still really weird. Like, remember when Maroon 5 was interesting? But his hook on that track went on to become its own song Song on Maroon 5's second album. So following late registration, its accompanying tour, and a risque Rolling Stone cover depicting Kanye as Jesus, bet that'll be the last time something like that happens, he began work on his third album and the final part of the Dropout Bear trilogy, if you will. He planned a release date of September 11th, 2007, but hold the phone. Another album was supposed to come out that day. 50 Cent's Curtis. He sends a very big rapper. Does Kanye know what he's doing by releasing it the same day? This could end his career. The ensuing release date has everybody excited to see who would be the champion. A real David versus Goliath story. Man, remember the times when Kanye would reasonably be considered David in this situation? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway, the 11th comes and Kanye blasts 50 Cent out of the water. Graduation sells incredibly well, and for good reason. It's a record with pristine production and quality hooks, 
though I find it doesn't really carry the same weight as his first two records. Tracks like Drunken Hot Girls deserve to be forgotten, like a bottle of Patron spilled on the club floor. But songs like I Wonder, Champion, Stronger, The Glory, which I think is one of his most underrated tracks, and Good Life are some of the best pop rap tracks of the 2000s. So Kanye has officially graduated to the big leagues, and from here on out his life is nothing but success, with no pain whatsoever to speak of. Now let's all take a look at the title of his next album. Oh no, an ampersand? Two months after graduation released, Kanye's mother passed away. I typically wouldn't put so much emphasis on that because it's, you know, celebrities, celebrity deaths, family members of celebrities. It's not really any of my business, but I bring it up here because it basically redirected Kanye's trajectory as a creative and was one of the big inspirations for this album. I don't know if there's a term for this kind of album. Uh, the closest thing I've come up with is a mass exodus album where the artist has gone through such emotional pain that the only way that they can get through it is to release music that is emotionally blunt and often difficult to listen to, whether it be because of the lyrics or the sound or both. Kanye's lyricism on here is so basic and candid about the death of his mother and his breakup with then-girlfriend Amber Rose, and the production here is often frigid and unwelcoming. There's also the fact that he doesn't rap on this at all. He just sings with autotune the entire time. I can totally see how this would be very off-putting at the time, but looking back, I'm surprised at how well it's aged and how influential it's become to so many artists today. It was Kid Cudi's first real breakthrough, and it basically birthed artists like Drake, or at least the sound that they became popular from. I can't say that I enjoy this record as a full listen every single time, but it is absolutely one of the most important records of the bunch. I'm really happy for you, I'm let you finish. It's weird that this one moment at the MTV VMAs is, is like a crucial turning point for both Kanye and Taylor Swift, right? Like that's profoundly weird. Anyway, at the 2009 VMAs, Kanye interrupted Taylor Swift as she was accepting an award. Uh, he did let her finish and everyone on the planet thought Kanye was an ass. This incident led Kanye to avoid the spotlight for a while and coop up in a studio in Hawaii. Man, Kanye's ukulele album is gonna be great. He dropped several singles as part of his Good Friday campaign, some of which eventually ended up on the next record. What was the next record, you may ask? This is the one. I put this as number two on my top 10 albums of the 2010s video. Uh, I said it in that video and I'll say it here again. This channel might not exist if I hadn't heard this album. And I don't mean that in like a morbid way. Before hearing this album, I didn't care much about rap music. I didn't really care much about any music. I think my main musical consumption was like movie soundtracks and Guitar Hero games. I think on Facebook, I listed my musical taste unironically as all music except rap and country. But it was after hearing this album that I thought to myself, this is what music could be? It could pull from all sorts of different genres and be grand and sweeping, yet still be rooted in empathetic and relatable feelings. And from there, that led me to dive into modern music more, which led me to take on music more in my education, which gave me the background to eventually start a channel like this. I know my take here was a little bit more personal than the other albums so far, but A, I think everything to say about this album has already been said, and B, I think it'll give you a good insight as to why I feel the way I do about the rest of the albums going forward. Speaking of which, his next studio album was about three years off, but that doesn't mean he wasn't busy. Now ask yourself, what on earth could get people more excited than a new Kanye album? Easy. Kanye and his mentor, his big brother, if you will, Jay-Z, together on one album. It's good. The production on here is lavish to the highest degree, just like Fantasy was, though it's a little bit more conventional than that album. Guests like Beyonce and an up-and-coming Frank Ocean do great work here. Otherwise, it's Kanye and Jay-Z talking about how great they are, with tracks that sound like they could end world hunger tomorrow and still be loaded. Uh, not every track on here is a winner, but still, definitely worth checking out. His next project was a compilation album with the rest of Good Music, his label, and it, it's, it's whatever. The quality ranges pretty drastically all over the place. Um, the singles aren't too shabby, but it, it's not a crucial piece of Kanye's work. Wait, how did this one get here? 
I already did the Death Grips video. I know I got a bad reputation. Joking aside, Kanye's sixth album had all the hype in the world surrounding it. Thanks to tidbits from collaborators like Chief Keef, Travis Scott, Daft Punk, videos that were projected onto the sides of buildings, two really excellent SNL performances. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, the man you came to see, Kanye West. What? So how was the album? Pretty great, honestly. Like many artists who have to follow up their magnum opus, Kanye scaled things back and got raw. The production is far more minimalist in terms of space in the mix, but what is there is distorted and blaring and abrasive, and how many more synonyms can I get out of this? Was it groundbreaking like so many people thought it was? Eh. Like I joked earlier, Death Grips had been around for a few years, and the whole album sound is influenced by Chicago Drill. But Kanye's trademark talents for curation and melody are what breathe new life into these sounds. I should also say, Kanye is filthy on this thing. I can't show any of these lines because, again, I try to make these videos accessible to everyone, but if you know this record, you know the lines I'm talking about. Taken as a whole, and especially considering Bound 2 as the closing track, I see this album as Kanye excising the most primitive and depraved parts of his soul. And by the end of the album, he's saying to someone, possibly Kim Kardashian, his partner, who he would be having a kid with the same month this album dropped, he's saying to them, hey, I'm a goddamn asshole. Do you still love me? Anyway, the album is released to critical and commercial acclaim. Kanye goes on a sick tour to promote it, though I'm still bummed that we never got the movie. One brief note before moving on, though. The album was supposed to be much longer and expansive, but at the last minute, Kanye, with the help of Rick Rubin, pared it down to about 40 minutes. Sounds thrilling, but I'm sure that'll be the last time Kanye tries to make last-minute changes to albums, right? <laughs> Uh, apologies in advance, but this is going to end up being probably the most long-winded part of the whole video. This was the last time that I really followed along with a Kanye West album cycle, and it was exhausting. The one-off singles, the name changes, that damn notepad. The full album debuted with the Yeezy Season 3 line at Madison Square Garden, but even then it wasn't finished. The album still had to be mastered, and Chance the Rapper was apparently holding up the album's release, marking the first time Chance the Rapper was responsible for a big day going wrong. The weekend after the Madison Square Garden show, Kanye performed on SNL and announced the album with the iconic line, Album sure, Kanye West com right now, title stream it right now, right now, blah blah blah. But even then, it wasn't done. The website selling the album crashed, and I know because I was on it trying to get it, and Kanye announced that he would be revising the mixes and track list, considering the album as a living, breathing, changing, creative expression, which is a fun way of saying I uploaded the rough mixes by accident. To recap every single thing that happened with this rollout would probably take its own deep discog dive, and that's before you even get to the music. So how's the album? Good, but it really depends on how willing you are to embrace Kanye as a manic creative and forgive his shortcomings. This thing is bursting at the seams with guests and producers and lyrical gems from Kanye, and as a result, this might be the most hit and miss record of his entire catalog. But hey, even a broken clock can write No More Parties in LA or Ultra Light Beam. Speaking of Ultra Light Beam, one of the main lyrical focuses is Kanye aiming to be a better man in the eyes of God, yet still being so engrossed in a world of sin. It's a really Really fascinating focus, and it's a big reason why I defend this album. It also flows deceptively well, even despite its frenzied nature. But again, its appeal is really dependent on whether or not you're willing to get through the clunky songs and the lines about leaving fridges open and somebody taking a sandwich, or getting bleach on your t-shirt after... You know. Anyway, he went on tour in support of the album with that floating stage of his, but he had to cut it short because of mental exhaustion. So hopefully he'll take some time to recharge, and he'll come back more focused and composed, and he won't say anything dumb, and his phone password won't be six zeros in a row. I feel like I appreciate the idea of this record more than the actual execution. Kanye taking a look at his own mental psyche and his battles with mental illness and bipolar disorder sounds like a really compelling record. And the production works really well sometimes. Standouts include the choruses on violent crimes, those noise blasts on the last minute of All Mine, the sparse gospel stylings of Wouldn't Leave. But then you remember that the music as a whole 
doesn't really have its own identity when compared to the rest of Kanye's work. Most of the stuff honestly sounds like Life of Pablo B-sides. Plus, when Kanye does actually open his mouth, he makes Me Too a verb, he brings up that slavery was a choice line, he imagines his daughter's future sexual interactions in fairly lurid detail. Even for a seven-track album, this thing is a mess. Which could be explained by Kanye's mental issues, or it could be explained by the fact that he was working on four other albums at the time. Ye was made on a ranch in Wyoming, and Kanye produced four other albums by other artists that were all released within the span of five weeks. The other albums range from good, to meh, to fine, to very no. My personal favorite out of the five, though, is Kid Sea Ghosts, Kanye's collaboration with Kid Cudi. Frankly, this record is Ye, but done well. This album also focuses on mental struggles, though I find its portrayal far more compelling, honestly. Plus, the production as a whole takes more from psychedelic rock than Ye did. I think Ye just did it really for Ghost Town, which gives this record a truly unique identity. So after Wyoming came a few one-off singles, some more public statements, the announcement, postponement, and leak of a prototype album called Yandi, and this new series of concerts he was doing with the full gospel choir, called Sunday Service. Starting in January 2019, he took this choir to Coachella, Calabasas, Salt Lake City, Joel Osteen's megachurch. This was all in lead up to his most recent album. <sighs> okay, so remember how I said with The Life of Pablo that the most compelling part was the split between the pious man God wanted Kanye to be and the hedonistic man Kanye actually was? Well, let's just scrap that and just make an album about how great God is, woo! Now, all joking aside, I have no problem with making music about celebrating God or any higher power. In fact, I was pretty hopeful that we would be getting what was basically an album of the Sunday service concerts, because from what I had seen from those, those were pretty engrossing. But the, the, the choir's not really on here all that much, and the production and the mixing are all incredibly haphazard, even after the updates. Then when Kanye does start speaking, it's, you know, basic espousing of God's greatness. And when he's not talking about that, he's talking about how he needs to charge so much money for his merch, or Chick-fil-A! Then, to make matters worse, the Sunday Service Choir put out their own album a few months after this one. It sounds fine, but it goes on for so long with not really enough to keep you engaged. This whole thing sounds and feels rushed. It doesn't feel like Kanye wanted to celebrate God with a labor of love. It sounds like he wanted a tax write-off. I called the head of Payless. I'm like, I'm dead. And there you have it, the first time anyone's ever given their opinion on Kanye West online. <sighs> I'm honestly kind of exhausted talking about Kanye and his albums and reliving the experiences I had following along with his career and output. I do know why I used to follow his every move. When his music works, it works like no other artist out there. But in recent years, that spark hasn't been there musically and I just feel so worn out by the discourse surrounding him to the point where I feel like that's the thing that he's most known for, most notable for, uh, the attention-grabbing things that he says. And I'll echo a point from that Top 10 Albums of 2010s video. Uh, some of you might want to separate the art from the artist, and if you do, I'm not going to tell you how to listen to music or live your life, uh, but I feel like that's the thing that makes Kanye so captivating. It's, it's the synergy of who he is as a person and the music that he makes. That's what has made him such an enduring icon. So in that sense, I'm actually kind of glad that I got his dive out of the way. Um, here are the albums that I think are most important to his discography. Here are the ones I think you should check out if you're new. Uh, if you want to talk about your favorite Kanye albums or leave a ranking or anything like that, you are more than welcome to do so in the comments. And as a reminder, the poll for the next Deep Discog Dive is in the description down below. Kanye, do you want to add anything else? I called the head of Payless. I called the head of Payless. Thank you, Kanye. Very cool. Thank you.